I'm here now with Virgil Posty Armstrong, and we're here also at the Sedona Conference. Um, Posty? You can you call me Virgil, please? Okay. Well, I knew yeah. you was Posty yeah. years ago. And, okay. Yeah. I'm trying to change it. All right. Uh, well, Virgil, you're in a little different realm than most. You've been involved with military intelligence over the years. What got you first involved with the UFO phenomena? Well, my first exposure to it was in 1948 with the ca second capture of a UFO in the United States at White Sands uh, Proving Grounds, New Mexico. And this was a capture as opposed to a crash? Well, actually what it was was a soft landing, of course, and then subsequently it was a capture. I, I would say it was a presentation. Um, we had had several disastrous crashes the year before in the Roswell, New Mexico area. And uh, they had impacted and uh, scattered bodies and uh, pieces of the craft all over the landscape. We did get one body out of that, but we didn't have much to go on. And I feel that that uh, crash or presentation, you call it what you will, in White Sands, New Mexico, was to write the air that they made in the, the first uh, three or four introductions. And so that craft came down silently, had five occupants. Uh, later turned out they were all dead. It was a soft landing, and of course it was in the middle of the, the most sensitive proving grounds in the world, then and probably even now. And um, so I think it was a way of saying to us, you know, there was a greater intelligence watching all that we were doing, particularly in terms of our uh, atomic and uh, nuclear advancement and um, weaponry. And uh, so that was my first uh, introduction to it. And uh, of course, from then on, it became a, um, a subject of interest. And, uh, but I really did nothing seriously about it. That was 48. And then I retired from the military in 1962. And some years later is when I took it up as a, a full-time pursuit to research it and to, to delve into it, to, and particularly from a spiritual aspect, uh, to see what more I could find out about it. What did you find out about it? What's the essence of what you found? Well, the essence, after all these years of research, is that they are us and we are them. <laughs> and, you know, and there's really no great mystery. Uh, as, as I said the other night, um, it's no longer UFO, it's IFO. It's an identified flying object. There are a few unanswered questions, um, you know, uh, although we have some uh, pretty good um, uh, surmising uh, conclusions. For instance, uh, we know today that many of the craft are those owned by the United States or now Russia or possibly South Africa. Now, being involved with military intelligence, why has this involvement occurred without the public's knowledge? Well, it started out in 1948. I asked the same question. Uh, at that time, of course, it was top secret. It should have been. I had to agree with it. But I asked my commanding officer at that time... what War of the Worlds did. Yes. Yes, exactly. Well, that's exactly what he said. I said, look, why isn't this being given to the public? I think they have a right to know. Well, first of all, I was told as a military officer to mind my own business by my superior, and uh, I was not happy about that, and uh, he saw I wasn't. He says, well, he says, maybe you deserve an explanation. He said, the reason is we don't want another Orson Welles scare, you know, invasion from Mars, that, that same thing. Well, it had some validity in those days, and I, I accepted it with tongue-in-cheek, although I didn't agree with it, you know. Being a military officer, though, I had to, of course, conform. Not rock the boat. Yeah, right. And uh, so I didn't. Uh, but that later became a catch-22 right up to this present-day age, you know. You've been rocking the boat here oh, lately. Oh, you bet I have. Well, I started not so much now as I did, say, in 1980 on. Uh, it's like I said the other night, these people wouldn't be here today disclosing what they are now if I had not done it in 1980 and challenged the government and said, look, you characters, I said, you damn well have lied to us about all of this. We do have our own UFOs. We are on the moon. We are on Mars. And you're denying this to the people. Why? And as I said also, uh, as a result of that, I had three attempts in my life. Now, I couldn't say that was a government. Maybe it was a Christian group. I don't know. But there was somebody who didn't like what I had to say. And they, they made it uh, well you known. You definitely know you'd uh, push the button yeah, somewhere. That's right. I pushed the buttons. Uh, I had Wendell Stevens with me at, at that time and Jim Delatosa. And um, anyhow, that was the beginning of the breaking down of the, the barriers of uh, secrecy. And um, I continued to do it, and I continued to, to walk through it and around it and uh, from it and survived 
that encouraged others to do it, and uh, we see what the state of the art is today. But I'm the guy who pushed the door open. So. Well, I don't know whether to thank you yet or not. Yeah, well, that's a good, that's good point. And that's up to you. Yeah, that's right. It's up to them. But I feel that, you know, uh, I feel that we're going to have major disclosures here in the very near future because I talked a little while ago about the uh, mass exposure, of course, in Belgium, you know, 60-some craft hovering over the city of Brussels. And everybody from the man in the street to the, the men in Parliament saw it and all admit that they saw it, policemen, military alike. Wasn't there a flyover at the, the White House? Oh, in the yes, 50s? in the 1950s, but it was quickly uh, heist. It appeared in the newspapers, the Washington Post one day, and then the next day it was nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, that was eminent to a landing and, of course, our getting in bed with the Greys. Uh, later, Truman went out and, of course, with uh, Forrestal and others, actually had a meeting with those people and made a pact or an agreement that uh, we would work with them and we would allow them to use the American people as biological research entities and uh, for a transfer or trade if you will of their expertise and knowledge about space and their technology and for lack of a better we have allowed that to take place have we that's not? right we have and now of course the consciousness is raised people have a right to demand to know more now, if the, if the government does not listen to the people, I can assure you that by the spring of next year, the ETs are going to make their presence known. They've already done it in Belgium. They wiped out the central computer. And uh, it's just a matter of time before, and I say the latest spring next year, that they will do the same thing here in the United States. There will be mass flyovers, and the government will have to say, yes, buddy, they're here. And in their defense, the government's defense, I would have to say that they're attempting to do that. First of all, they, they attempted to do it through the movies, uh, Close Encounters of a Third Kind, E.T., The Day the Earth Stood Still, and all these. Uh, these are paid advertisements, so to speak, to you and I to let us know that these things do exist and they are here. Soften the blow. To soften the blow, exactly. And. Uh, now on TV, every time you turn on the TV, uh, you got a program on crop circles or uh, UFOs or something like that. Major stations are now carrying it more and more every day. So I think this is also a step in the right direction. But there has to be a creditable um, explanation and release by the government in the very near future in order to uh, satisfy the people. So clear all this mess up once clear and for it up. all. Exactly. It has to be done. Virgil, yeah. thank you very much. You're quite welcome. And God bless you and good journey. Huh? Take care. Bye-bye.